and great men and women of God. It's wonderful just to be with you again and just trusting what God wants to do. I'm so excited. I'm excited for the Word of God in people's lives. I'm excited for the Word of God in your life. And I really just desire just to see the knowledge of, let's call them spiritual beings, just being, just being properly comprehended from Scripture. It's interesting when it comes to the subject of angels and demons, how many false doctrines are out there. You know, we have all these kind of like floating doctrines in America concerning angels. And you might hear about angels all the time, particularly if you listen to American television or you can listen to American talk shows. Angels are very popular at the moment. And then, of course, on television, demons are everywhere. There's always this thing's called a demon and that thing's called a demon. And that's coming through a fourth one. It's a demon. And it's the devil has just taken things and just... Um, blown it out of proportion so that things are not properly analyzed or understood and concerning with the Word of God. And that's why we study. That's why we are studying angels and demons and trying to gain more and more insight as, as the Lord opens our minds and our hearts and just takes us further and further forward. So it's great to be with you. Um, it really is. And I know that you're learning all the time. So let's continue uh, where we left off with angels. With angels, we talked a, we've talked quite a lot on different subjects and different sections. So I'm just going to continue to take my notes and go through step by step and just talk to you a little bit more about what we know about angels because of what the Bible tells us. And remember, the Bible doesn't put us a comprehensive section or chapter or three of just about angels. It doesn't do that. But it tells us by hearing and reading about it in different places, we start to learn um, about angels in comparison with what the Lord is revealing. Okay, one of the things we do know for certain is that angels have different levels of authority. And that makes sense, really, because if you study the, the works of darkness, we get a feeling of the different levels of authority. And in the world of angels, <clears throat> in the world of angels, we discover that there are different levels of authority. For one thing, we do hear about the term archangel. Now, the Bible doesn't mention the term archangel very frequently. It, it, it mentions it in Thessalonians, where it talks about 1 Thessalonians and the voice of the archangel. And it talks about Michael the archangel in the book of Jude. There are very, very small references, but they are enough for us to know that there are different levels. An archangel, by its very nature, by the, by the position, for instance, in the voice of the archangel, it is a position of authority, a position of a messenger. And so we are familiar with the term archangel. Um, in the old days, in the, in the times of the early, uh, early church, the Catholics um, very much understood that there were lots of archangels because there was other, other apocrypha documents available at the time. Um, but so, so we can make assumption just from, the, from, from life and the Word of God, we can make that assumption that there, there are more than one archangel. Um, uh, you know, as I say, the, the Catholics listed, I think, seven different archangels by name. Uh, it is generally assumed that Gabriel, although the Bible doesn't say it explicitly, is an archangel. So, so um, he, Gabriel does say, I, I stand at the side of the presence of God when he spoke to Zechariah. So that did give a kind of a position and a place that Gabriel was claiming. Um, so, so we do often see Gabriel as an archangel, though the Bible doesn't expressly tell us that. Um, and so it makes sense then that in Amongst angels, there are different levels of angels, different authorities, different positions. We kind of have a feeling that, you know, Lucifer fulfilled a very, very high place before he fell and became Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, and all those names that we've already, or we're going to learn about. Um, so archangels does, so we can kind of imagine that angels work together in ranks. Angels have different roles, and different positions, and obviously assign different things depending on their rank and the position um, that they are, are um, given by God. So it's well worth understanding that. Now, let's just talk a little bit about the term living creature. And it's probably good for us to do this. You see, sometimes we call every, you know, sometimes in, in kind of Christianese, what we can do is we can start to say every Everything that is in heaven, that's an entity or that has wings, maybe we call an angel. But that's not necessarily what the Bible does. Remember, I told you that the word angel precisely means messenger. Okay, so um, that is the Greek. That is the Hebrew. A messenger of God is Eternus and Corsi, a messenger of God. Okay, so um, not every everything in the, in the heavenlies is necessarily referred to as an angel. 
Um, first of all, we often refer to the heavenly creatures. The Bible is quite, quite certain and quite clear about that, um, about heavenly creatures. And um, we hear about the creatures around the throne in the book of Revelation. So we're very clear about that. So it's very important to understand that God has made all kinds of creatures. As we read it, maybe use the term creatures. And, you know, we may get to heaven and find there's names for these different things God has made. But the point of the matter is we just say heavenly creatures, things that God has made that's unique in heaven. Uh, we hear about multiple eyes and things like that, which might look really weird and scary for us. But I think in heaven we will understand it fully. Uh, what is known on earth is not, we will know something different in heaven. We can only just describe it. Now there are two other terms that are frequently used um, and they also have interesting plurals. They are cherubs, they're plurals cherubim, and they're seraphs, and the plural is seraphim. Cherubim and seraphim. Now let's just talk a little bit about it. And what I want to do is I want you to take you to Ezekiel chapter 10. And what we're going to do is back in Ezekiel, you may remember it from, uh, well actually, Ezekiel is a very important, one I'll refer to as the main, one of the major prophets. Um, in the Bible, and Ezekiel was a was a mighty man of God, and he got a uh, he got a vision of the throne, just as Isaiah got the vision of the throne of God, and um, he described the cherubim. Now it's interesting how some of the verses come out. Have a little look at at verse fifteen. You can read the whole of the chapter. Then the cherubim arose upward. These were the living creatures I had seen by the Kiba River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their sides. And when the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. And when the cherubim rose, they rose with them because the spirit of the living creatures because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. So we find out that cherubim have wings, they rise with the, in different ways, but yet the Bible still describes them as living creatures, all right? Um, you know, so, so do we then say cherubim are angels? No, there are different uh, Hebrew words for them, different Greek words, different Hebrew words particularly, because a lot of them are mentioned in the Old Testament with cherubim. We also know that cherubim were, were molded over the Ark, Ark of the Covenant, I'm sure you're familiar with that, a golden box that was was carried around by Moses and the people of Israel where God resided and God said over that I want you to place a mercy seat and the mercy seat was formed by the wings of the cherubim all right um, the cherubim I'm sure when it was molded looked a bit like angels as we know it but notice here how Ezekiel calls them cherubim how God through Ezekiel this prophetic voice calls them cherubim how how um, they are called living creatures in this verse. So it's, it's probably not biblically accurate to say cherubim are angels. It's probably more bi biblically accurate to say cherubim are living creatures that God has made in his, for his throne room and for his glory. Um, they are not, they're called cherubim because they're not messengers. All right. So messengers are angels and that's the, that's the right definition. Okay. So, in, while in Revelation 5 verse 11, we found that the angels surround the living creatures and there's a difference between them. So, if you look at Re Revelation 5 verse 11, we find that there's a difference between the living creatures. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, number of thousands, upon thousands, and ten thousand, then circled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. So, immediately we see a distinction again between the angels and the living creatures and of course you can read all about the different living creatures from this this vision as well as they cried out holy 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 so we can see a distinction between the living creatures and the angels we see that the cherubim are living creatures and are not necessarily seen as angels although generally in colloquial christianity we see them as angels but it's they're not exactly defined as such all right, the word cherub is found 91 times in the Old Testament. Most are mentioned in line with the cherubs that are found in the ark in Exodus 25 verse 18 onwards. All right, so that's the introduction to the word cherubim or cherub. We also know that Lucifer before he fell was a cherub. So there's, there's, there's this 
heavenly creature God has made that he is called cherub and cherubim and we are not certain if they look exactly like angels because angels are messengers that are very very nature of them where the cherubim don't seem to be messengers at all so just keep that in your mind as you study it now in Isaiah of course we have another vision and he uses the word seraphim which is fascinating about its own now I'll give you my interpretation of it sometimes when one studies the word of God we have to interpret it slightly I'll give you my interpretation of what really happened when Isaiah went to heaven and he saw these creatures. You see, sometimes when the creatures are mentioned in the Bible, we just assume that um, they are God's name for these creatures. But Isaiah was very aware of, of, let me put it to you this way. When you, when you see something brand new that your mind has never conceived, no one on earth has ever seen, and you suddenly see something and it's flying and it's awesome, what do you do in trying to describe it? Well, you generally start with the closest animal thing, object that fits in with that description, and then you, then you expand on it. So if, a, if, if something with four legs with a flat thing and a bulge, I might say, well, it was a table with a bulge in it. So what we do is we use natural objects that people can relate to and then we just try to add on a little bit more description to try to help people to imagine what we're seeing. Now, Isaiah said they were seraphim. But why seraphim? You see, the interesting thing is the word seraphim or seraph is actually refers to a creature that was known on earth. It's not hard to prove from um, Josephus, from Herodotus, who's the historian of the, of the ancient times, um, called the father of all history, really. Um, that there were creatures in the, time, in the time of Isaiah called seraphim that were actually reptilian in, in nature. You could almost say they were like serpents and they flew. Now, it sounds really, really weird, but they were called seraphim. And they were well known. You can study them in Josephus. You can study them in Herodotus. You can find out that these creatures existed. And my feeling is that when that Isaiah knew what they looked like and he had one look in heavens and he said, this is a seraphim. Okay, um, and so if you want to study that further, you can, but I don't think that's God's name for these creatures. Again, the best term possibly is just heavenly creatures. And we find out in Isaiah chapter 6, they were crying out, holy, holy, holy to the Lord. And that was the vision that Isaiah received. All right. Now, although it may not be, I'm just going to mention this because, you know, I'm taking things, I'm moving on to my next little piece of here. One of the main tasks of angels is to worship Jesus and to worship God. And we find that in the scripture in Hebrews chapter 1. And we find it in many, many places throughout the Bible. Let the angels worship him. So the reality is all these angels that God has made, they are obedient to God, obedient to his will. And they actually worship Christ. They glory in God. They really, really do. Remember, we've actually re heard a little bit about how they rejoice there's rejoicing in heaven when one person gets saved. They are intimately and deeply involved with, with salvation and the glory of God and what God is doing. They really are. Um, they're more in tune with it, far more in tune with it than what we are. We struggle with the Spirit of God to see rightly and correctly um, you know, through all the forces of darkness that hinder us. But angels see it extremely, extremely clearly, the will of God and the glory of God. And so angels worship God. We can find this in Hebrews chapter 1. We find that there's a command there where it talks about, it should be pointed out that the ancient Jews used to believe that uh, the Old Testament came through angels. Uh, and the reason, the reason for that is, well, it's quite complicated. But because they did, um, Hebrews chapter 1 had to be had to be written and one of the things that they point out is in verse 6 again when God brings his firstborn into the world he says let all God's angels worship him okay and then later on we hear obviously this is at the end of the 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 particular chapter chapter one are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation so the reality is angels are called to worship God. You find that quite a bit in Revelation as well. They will be worshiping Jesus and they'll be worshiping side by side with you. It's going to be a glorious time in heaven. Remember, we are coming to the heavenly Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, where thousands upon thousands of angels are in joyful assembly, worshiping God. So you can look forward to it 
uh, they are here with you, obviously on earth to protect you and to look after you. And the Bible tells us that. Hallelujah. It should be pointed out that angels are primarily directly under God. They hear from God. They serve God. They don't serve you and me. They serve us in Christ. They attend to us, but they're not like your slaves that you can command or speak to or say, go there, go there, and so on. We don't go into that type of philosophy. That is not biblical. We don't go there. We believe. We know the angels are with you, but you don't have to command them. Generally, you, the way you do it is you ask God, say, God, send your angels here. Look off. Send your angels, oh God, to, to, to look after my car. Send your angels, oh God, to be with me as I go through this dangerous area. And the Lord hears that prayer and he will send his angels. Hallelujah. All right. Now, in Daniel chapter 10, we get a bit of an indication as well about the roles of angels concerning their fighting spiritual forces of darkness. Uh, He said, you'll notice that in Daniel chapter 10, verse um, 20. So he said, do you, do you know why I've come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I'll tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against him except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. So this angel is talking about the spiritual forces and the spiritual fights that occur in the heavenly and how much energy and effort and in fact it took um, for this angel to arrive um, you'll find that also in, in Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days and Michael one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision contains a time yet to come so what do we see here we see 21 days he couldn't get through the message couldn't get through to daniel even though he was dispatched he was sent as an angel to bring the message the message was hindered why was it hindered because of the spiritual forces of darkness that were fighting against that particular angel until he had assistance from Michael, only then was their ability for the message to come through. And this shows us that there are angelic forces against the spiritual forces of darkness all around us all the time. All right. So that angel have been fighting, we've been held up by other spiritual forces. So he's talking about princes, he's referring to the angel Michael, Archangel Michael, coming to help. We also have a reference to all the different spiritual forces that he's fighting against, often referring to, to Persia and to Greece, which were nations, but each nation is often bound by a certain amount of spiritual forces, and those spiritual forces were impacting and holding back the angel from getting to Daniel. So we're starting to feel the spiritual battle that is actually happening at all times in the heavenlies. That is what's happening. All right. So that's why you must pray and you must keep praying. You must distrust God. It's going to come through. The victory is there because maybe the angels, the promises of God, the, the things God wants to give you has been held back by all the different spiritual forces fighting against you. So stand firm. The Lord is on his throne. Hallelujah. Nothing will, will get to you. The promises of God will get to you, but the works of darkness never will. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, um, Hebrews 12, verse 22, lovely verse. Thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. I want you just to know this in your heart. If you, when you and I go to heaven and we are in heaven, we will find thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful, joyful assembly. 12, verse 22, but you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heaven of Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn. It's going to be in a joyful place when you are there worshiping God. Uh, I think those angels are going to shout for joy. You're going to shout for joy. You're going to dance. The angels are going to dance. You can just imagine the experience we are going to have in heaven out of joy and glory as we serve the Lord up there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's just talk a little bit about guardian angels. Let's talk about guardian angels. Now, you know, we often hear that that's a very common theme for worldly people sometimes is, I have a guardian angel, I have a guardian angel. And let's understand it from a biblical perspective. We pretty much have um, two verses. Let's have a, first of all, the Bible is quite clear that angels do attend to us. 
So in Mark 1 verse 13, we can see that Jesus was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. So the Bible says if the angels can attend to Jesus and to his needs when he's facing these temptations in the middle of the desert, uh, hunger, thirst, whatever it was he was going through, and yet the Bible says he was with the wild angels, uh, with the wild animals, which by the way is a very big thing. You, you've got to be in lion country and know there's wild lions around and walk through that country before you really understand what it's like to be with the wild animals. Um, uh, yeah. So unless you've, if you've never had those fears, it's, it's a real reality. Um, still in a lot of Africa. So uh, yes. And the verse says there, Jesus and the, and the angels attended to him. So we can, we can claim that for ourselves. You know, when we're facing things, are not the angels attending to you and me? Are they not looking after us? Are they not walking with us? We're going to discover possibly, and I believe this, that every child of God who's serving Jesus has a guardian angel to walk with him, to stick with him, to stay with him. I think you can trust God that that guardian angel is with you and walking with you. That is God's promise for you almost in so many ways. Um, we have, let's read together. Matthew 18 verse 10, one of the most interesting verses in the Bible. It's almost like Jesus just gave us a little spot, a little moment. He just touched on something, came along and he said, here is what I want to tell you about young children. And you know, and as he says this, it's a very glorious thing. Uh, you know, one of my greatest desires is for you to work for the Lord, to understand the Spirit of God and what it means to work for God, to build up for yourself treasures in heaven and stop worrying so much about earth, really. You know, get, get your basic provisions and just thank God for that. You know what I mean? But sometimes we get so caught up with the things of this world and the flesh. I really, really want you to try to avoid that. Um, instead, I want you to learn to focus and set your mind on things above, to look forward to the glory and to work for God, to really to work for God. So let's just talk a little bit about this verse here in Matthew 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, talking about children. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Do not despise one of the little ones, okay? Jesus is saying, listen guys, don't despise the children. Don't push the children aside because they have an angel who sees the face of the Father in heaven, which immediately gives indication that those angels of these children have more access to the Father than other angels. Their angels always see the face of the Father in heaven. What does this mean? Well, it probably means that there's angels moving between this child and God, and that angel has a right to write to the face of the Father, the ability to report back to the Father exactly what is going on to the child at all times. And Jesus is saying, don't despise the kids. In other words, if you go along and you despise the kids, the angel of that child is going to go to the Father in heaven. It's going to tell the Father in heaven straight away, listen, that person is despising the, my one I'm guarding, my, this child. All right? And so if you then, also from that, we can see that if you show love, if you show compassion, if you show interest to children, God will bless you. He will bless you because the angels will report back and they'll be rejoicing in heaven because of your kindness and your patience. We must be very careful we don't get caught up in the flesh. The flesh gets into so many places. We devalue the children and we value the older individuals who have money and have status. But God says value those who have less status in your society, which means you look at them and you say, I want to. I want to care for these children. And you know that they have angels in heaven who are going to go and report back how you've cared and how you've looked after them. Now, those are obviously guardian angels. Those are angels with them. And we can also understand that there may be guardian angels for us. And I think that's something we can just trust God, that it is. There's been other testimonies I've heard that we do as children of God have guardian angels. But not everybody on this earth does. Only the saved. You love Jesus. You serve Jesus. You've got a guardian angel walking with you. It's a mighty and a wonderful and a glorious thing. Praise God. So let's just talk about angels in human form. That is a very interesting thing. The Bible actually tells us that angels can take human form. 
and we find that in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. What is this Bible verse saying? It says that it's possible that a stranger that you meet at an odd place, possibly at an odd time, I don't know, or maybe a stranger you meet that you really just needed to meet somebody to lift up your spirits, and you meet a stranger and they start speaking into your life and they build up your heart and they build up your mind, you might actually be speaking to an angel. Now, I don't fully understand how it happens. There are testimonies. There are testimonies online of people who've been so encouraged by angels in this way. But the Bible says it happens. So the Bible says it happens means it can happen. Do you then go around? No. Just know that God can send his angels to support you when you need it most and you won't even know why. So let's just trust God for the supernatural. Anything is possible with the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, to finish off this lecture on angels, I've got to just talk a little bit about the danger of maybe people getting too much attached to angels to the point that we are no longer balanced. Remember, a lot of religions have started with messages from angels. The whole of Islam is based upon angel Gabriel coming to Muhammad. You know, don't kid yourself. People have got caught up in the wrong things. The whole Quran was written from, supposedly, from that. So, um, this, the Bible also has certain warnings which it does give to us in Colossians 2 verse 18. It says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. So now that is a fascinating verse. What is that actually saying? It says don't get caught up too much with individuals who are always just talking about the angels that they have seen. Now, that's an interesting thing at this current time because there's lots of testimonies maybe online and so on and so on. Don't get too caught up with that because the Bible says their unspiritual mind puffs them up. They think they're more important because they saw an angel or they think they're more important because they have an angel testimony. And sometimes those testimonies are not solid, they're not biblically solid. So you just have to, you have to hold them on with a very, very light, light grip. You, you've got to be careful here, all right? Um, the Bible is saying here that we can, they can become puffed up, they can become arrogant because of these things. Um, and uh, the history of the Christian church has shown that to be true. Okay, they, The Bible says they can go into great details upon what they've seen. So therefore, that is, is, is dangerous as well. So we've got to be careful of that. We've got to be careful of that because of the pride and the spirit of pride linked with it. They can present this revelation citing as something of great value that the core doctrine study of the word guidance by the spirit can have lost so what happens is sometimes people come back they have all these revelations and they they're actually describing stuff because they somehow feel oh we as the spirit the spirit of god guidance did not provide us with that information so this is going to excite us but and I, i'm not trying to say that such testimonies don't have value they do have value i've benefited from the test certain testimonies but i also realize it's a bit of a dangerous area. It's flaky and it's complicated. All right. You can trust God for angelic experiences. Maybe those will help you and encourage you in your walk. Daniel had them. It, you know, um, it it's, it's, can be glorious to have them. But don't think you're more special than anybody else. You know, the Lord often promotes those he gives the least help to in the sense that he will not necessarily give you all of these types of things because you are great in him. You know, his greatness can often be total walking by faith, relying on the word of God, standing on the word of God. So just know that. But do know that the angels are around you and they are commanded and sent out by God to attend to you and to help serve you. Okay, let me just do a summary then as we finish off. Applying angels into your life. Because now you've learned the basics of angels. We're not going to go over the top, get puffed up. We understand all the different elements concerning them. So what? how do we apply this? Okay, Angels are expressly mentioned in Psalm 91, which basically means um, they are mentioned in Psalm 91 in the way that they are because Psalm 91 is a safety psalm, a psalm that encourages us with our personal safety. We know with Elisha and the story of Gershwin and his servant, we know that 
that the servant couldn't see the angels and Elisha has said, oh God, open his eyes and suddenly he could see the angels. That helped him to realize and to overcome. We know also that Mark chapter 1 talks about the angels attending Christ. We also know that was a very hard time, a very difficult time for him. And so the angels came and they attended to him. So, so I think you start to see these kind of links here concerning angels and their involvement with us. Their main cause, their main aim is not to teach us or to necessarily guide us on our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. We have the Spirit of God for that. But they are there to protect us from spiritual forces. Okay, They're there to protect us from, from agents of the evil one, the people that have been influenced by the evil one who tried to do damage to us as well, in our spirits as well as on our bodies. And they're there to protect us. So we can trust God for them. Okay? Um, so it is totally acceptable, as I've said before, for you to ask God to send his angels. That is totally acceptable. And you can, it's also totally acceptable to carry around with you a spirit and a heart of just believing God's angels are present, that they're not far away, that they're nearby, that they are they're, they're walking with you and being with you. Um, it is totally acceptable to gain a spiritual insight of that. In fact, I would encourage it. Because I think, you know, if the Bible gives us these verses, that gives us these verses for a reason. It doesn't say your command is angels concerning you to guard you in all the ways, unless one, God was doing it, and two, you should meditate on it. So you must meditate on it. You need to build that into your heart. Do you know that the angels are with you? I think if we can have faith that the angels are with us, one, we actually have a lot more faith. Somehow it starts to just click in our spirits and our heart. Hey, we don't have to be frightened. Don't have to be frightened of those people or frightened of those animals or frightened of this or frightened of that. The angels are with you. They will look after you. God is with you. He will look after you. He's commanded his angels concerning you. So get to that place. Okay, and you will find if you can see and imagine that your angels are with you, you'll, you'll find that you have almost more faith just to approach life, to approach places of danger, to approach and not be frightened, amen, or to approach life and to pray for healing and to know that the angels, they're praying with you and it's going to come to pass because that angel's there. I think you can see all of that and I think it's biblical and I think it's totally acceptable uh, to see and to, to have trust in God for. So, uh, that is my talk on angels. I hope you enjoyed it. hope you were encouraged. I just want you to go out there, apply the angels and the knowledge of angels to your life. Don't get led astray. Don't get puffed up. Don't go into false doctrine. But allow the Spirit of God just to guide you forward in strength and might. Praise God. Father, I thank you for this time. Thank you for this teaching. Thank you, Father, for what you are revealing in every single side. Praise you, Lord God. And everybody said, Amen and Amen and Amen.